We are going live. We're live-ish. Now we're live. Excellent. Okay. Um, so last time we started the process of doing the nasty stuff, the uh, standard deviation, the Z scores, all the fun stuff that I hope is is clear now because I know you've all done the homework. By the way, how is the lab? The lab? Did you find the lab? The, it's good. All right, good. Because I the funny thing is they don't tell me where it is. That's why people get like, where is it? I don't know. So I know it says DEPT on your thing, but apparently it's a multi T140. I guess you know that now. So I found out yesterday. All right. Uh, yeah, organization skills. It's good times. Um, so if you have any requests for the lab, any particular skills you want us to cover that we don't cover, do let me know. Or open mind it that way. But as it stands, I do have a, a series of assignments we'll try to go through to um, help you build your skills in SPSS. Um, but again, if anything particular you want to know, we can add that to the list. If you're doing a research project, for example, that requires you to be able to do Fisher's exact test, ask us and we'll show you. Yes? No, it is not all the, it should be on many of them, but as far as I know, it's not on all of them. Okay? And again, you can always get a, a free evaluation copy. Yes? Would you suggest that we should do assignments on No, you can do it your own computer. It doesn't matter. SPSS is SPSS. Excel is Excel. The first assignment, it doesn't matter what you do it on. Absolutely fine. The answer should be the same. There will be a slight difference, like a 0.1% difference or something, depending upon the techniques that was used by that software package, but I have accounted for that in the evaluation scheme. Right? So uh, the idea is computers have been with us for a relatively short time. These techniques have been with us for a relatively long time. It shouldn't matter how you do them. You should get more or less the same answer. Right, so let us proceed. Today, we're talking about a little bit about simple probability, and it's the fun part of statistics. It's also the part I always get wrong. So we'll see if I get a lot of stuff wrong today, and maybe you've done some of this already in high school. Maybe you haven't. If not, we're going to go through it anyway. Um, some of what we talk about today is not covered in other versions of this class because there's a sense that it's not necessary. I think simple probability is relevant because it allows us to understand how these distributions came about uh, historically and why they matter. So, we talked about the bell curve last time, uh, the, the Gaussian, the normal distribution, and it's the most used and referred to of, of the great statistical distributions. It is not the only one. There are scores of different kinds of distributions that we draw upon in order to do our analyses, but this is the granddaddy of them all and the one that you are required to have some uh, familiarity with for this class, and probably for most of your careers. So um, the principal reasons, as I mentioned last time, is that normality, which is this idea that things look like this, is natural. It, uh, it occurs in nature um, in very social processes, in many biological processes, as we'll see in some very physical processes as well. So it begins historically, officially, with a guy named Abraham de Moivre, and uh, he was actually a statistician who consulted to gamblers. No, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, I mean, it's hard to believe that there was once a career where statisticians, pointy heads, could go and actually make a lot of money consulting to big shot gamblers in the 18th century. Today we'd call them card counters, I guess, people who try to game the system to get some advantage in, in uh, casinos. Um, and he was consulting with his gamblers, and he, and he discovered something called a binomial, well, he didn't discover a binomial distribution. He discovered that when a binomial distribution was computed for a large number of events, it started to look like this. What is a binomial distribution? That's when something has two possible outcomes. And the classic thing that has two possible outcomes is flipping a coin, right? Heads or tails. So, um, right. So here we're going to talk a little bit about the coin flip. The coin flip is a classic example of a random variable. Physically, it isn't really that random. There are elements of the coin that actually do kind of uh, compel it to go one way or the other due to the shape and how you flip it and things like that. And that's, we're getting into chaos theory there. It's out of nowhere. Consider it to be a perfect coin, though, that's not being impinged upon by any other superfluous forces, and the idea is it should result in a random outcome each time, right? either heads or tails, and never on its edge. So if you flip the coin twice, you're going to get really three possible outcomes. You're going to get two heads, two tails, or a head and a tail. The head and the tail occur in two different ways. 
Either it's going to be the first flip will give you a heads and the second flip will give you a tail, or the first flip will give you a tail and the second flip will give you a head. So our distribution in a table looks like this. Four possible outcomes, two flips. These ones occur once. This occurs twice. So here, if this represents two heads, there's a 25% chance you get two heads. There's a 25% chance you get two tails. There's a 50% chance you're going to get a head and a tail. If I increase that to four flips, that's a bit confusing, but um, you're going to get 16 possible outcomes, not just four, and half the time you're going to get two tails and two heads. Um, one out of those 16 times, you're going to get all heads. One out of those 16 times, you're going to get all tails. And the other outcomes are distributed that way. You start to see what's happening here, right? So if you flip it 12 times, suddenly it starts filling up a bit more. Right? If I flip it 12 times, it looks pretty much like a normal curve. If I flip it more and more, a billion times, you'll start to see that the outcomes are distributed this way in terms of the likelihood of the probabilities of each of the outcomes. Right? And each time, the most common outcome is going to be half tails and half heads. So that's a classic binomial event that is having a normal distribution. That was de Demavre's observation. But it turns out that he wasn't the only one. So he published his paper in 1733, but uh, it kind of got buried under you know, the mountains of literature. A guy named Carl Pearson rediscovered it in 1924 and started celebrating the life of de Demavre a bit more. Pearson is where we get the chi-square test from, and we'll talk about the chi-square in, in a few weeks. Um, we mentioned the greatest mathematician who ever lived, Gauss. So Gauss had done something similar to de Mavre in 1809, but he was looking at, I mentioned last time, astronomical observations. I don't remember exactly what the event he was examining, but he started noticing as well that these things with two possible outcomes were being distributed in this shape. So that's why today we call it a Gaussian distribution. It should be called a, probably a de Mavrian distribution, but Gauss got the credits. Galileo supposedly also observed something similar in the 17th century, and he was losing errors in his observations, trying to measure certain things in the sky, and those errors seemed to be occurring as certain probabilities. It had nothing to do with what he was doing, a human error. It was the nature of the universe was such that certain things were more probable than certain other things. And if you looked at the distribution of these probabilities, they all looked beautifully like this. Okay? A guy named Laplace in 1778 also discovered the curve independently, and he's the one who gave us what's called the central limit theorem, and we mentioned the central limit theorem last time. So historically, independently, all these clever people were discovering that the universe is distributed like this. What could it mean? It means there's an underlying kind of predictable randomness, if that's a thing. To the universe, and that's what we rely upon to do our statistical tests. We can now use this distribution to figure out if something is more or less likely to have occurred, and exactly more or less likely. And that's really what inferential statistics is, is determining if my experience, experiment rather, was more or less likely to have occurred given the completeness and fullness of the universe. That's the Moivre, by the way, if that matters to you. There he is. Okay, the central limit theorem, as I mentioned. What it really says is that most things tend to be shaped like this. That's what it really says. Okay, but the mathematical aspect of it is that um, a normal distribution is approached very quickly as n increases, n is the number of observations you have, and it has a standard deviation that looks like uh, uh, that and a variance that looks like that divided by the n, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, no matter what the shape of the original distribution, the sampling distribution approaches a normal. All right, what does that mean? Let's back up for a second. Okay. Even if something, this natural phenomenon, doesn't distribute beautifully like this, if I take random samples of things and compute their means, their means are going to be distributed like that. That's the magic of a central limit theorem. Even if something like IQ isn't distributed in this magnificent way, if I take various samples of the population, compute their IQs, and get the mean, the means tend to be distributed this way. And that's what allows us to do the magic of, of inferential stats. All right? It's not intuitive to worry about it. I was putting it out there. 
Okay. So we're going to look at a little bit what that means right now. So we're going to look at two coin flips. Um, two outcomes of two coin flips is definitely not a curve, right? We know that. I flip a coin twice, I either get um, uh, heads, tails, or heads, heads, or tails, tails, whatever it means. So, did it already. So here we have the probability of getting a heads if I flip it once. It's either a zero or a one. Right? That's not a curve, but it is technically a curve. If I start flipping more and more, I start getting something resembling a curve. That's really what Laplace was saying about central limit theorem, is even though something does not look normal, if I do it long enough and I take averages, I'm going to get that. Okay, I'm losing you. So here is, again, another, another depiction of the coin flips. This is if I flip it five times, ten times, or forty times, I start getting more and more normality, even though it's just single coin. All right, and we told this last time, this is the normal distribution, that's the probability, that's the actual formula for the normal. Don't worry about that, it looks scary, I just put it there to show you there is a mathematical foundation for it. It's a probability function. Okay, what does that mean? It means that we started out in this class talking about frequency distributions, and that's what this is, how often things happen. But now we moved on to probability. What this actually is depicting is the probability of something happening. Okay, that's why up here is 100% probability, and each point here is a little less probable. That's part of the function of normal distribution, is to make this linkage between frequency and probability. And we'll see how that works when we actually start doing statistical tests. We're going to do our t-test, for example, and we're going to relate our findings to where we think it falls on the normal distribution, and that will tell us the probability that our result was observed by chance alone, as opposed to being observed as something common. I know I'm losing. As I mentioned, we link frequency now to probability. It's got a bell curve. It's symmetrical. We mentioned all those things already. It's got a standard distribution. It's got a mean, all that stuff. This is just review right, right now. If you go to this website, you can play with some of the characteristics of a normal curve. I can't do it here because Java is not installed. It's weird. Um, it allows you to, to mess with the ends and the standard deviations of the means to see how that changes the shapes of our normal curve. Spend like two minutes doing it. Make yourself happy. Okay, so the standard normal is a special version of the normal curve. The normal family, normal family, the normal family of curves is just shaped like this. The, the, the canonical or the standard normal is exactly symmetrical. It's got a mean at zero and a standard deviation of exactly one. So what we try to do is in some of our computations, we try to convert the normal that we've computed in our in our population to the standard normal. So we do some mathematical transformations to move it over here. This, I said again, normal distributions are shaped like this, have certain characteristics. The standard normal is perfectly symmetrical, it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So most of our tests are designed relative to the standard normal. But like I said, most of the world is not standard. My phone. Okay, most of the world is not standard. If I'm doing a distribution of your midterm marks, the mean is not going to be zero. I hope it's going to be simply higher. Your standard deviation is going to be different, and all that stuff. That's why we invented z-scores as a way to standardize. Standardization is taking the distribution that I have and making it resemble the standard normal, making it resemble something that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So if I got these curves over here, I standardize them all to the standard normal. That way I can compare them now. So last time we did the z-scores, we defined the z-score as my mean minus the uh, parameter mean divided by standard deviation. And it tells me how many standard deviations away from the mean the point x lies. So again, we said we did last time that if you have a certain mark on your midterm, we can compute how many standard deviations away from the mean of the class your mark was. And the reason for that is, if you're trying to compare how well you're doing in this class versus another class, you can use standard deviations or z-scores to do that. Because sometimes the mean here is higher than the class. This is a way just to say, where am I relative to other people's rankings? 
rather than where am I relative to my other class marks, which can vary from class to class. Right? Just review from last time. Um, one thing I didn't mention is we usually compute Z score to two decimal places. It's a strange convention. Okay, we mentioned that three sigma rule. So if you score one standard deviation below the mean, you're looking at 16% of cases on each side. Two standard deviations is about 95 and a bit. Three standard deviations is about 99 point something percent. Right? So here are the actual numbers. A mean of plus or minus one standard deviation is two thirds of the area around the curve. Two standard deviations, about 95%, a little more than 95%. And the mean uh, plus or minus three standard deviations is about a little more than 99%. I keep saying that because it's kind of important to remember. Here, I've looked at 1.96 standard deviations from the curve. I've said Z equals 1.96. Remember, Z equals is the same as saying number of standard deviations. So 1.96, for some reason, I've chosen to look at. And the reason for that is 1.96 gives us exactly 95% under the curve. Remember, two standard deviations gave us 95 and a bit. 1.96 gives us exactly 95. You're going to see that 1.96 a few times. It comes up a lot. And the reason it comes up a lot is for that reason. It gives us this nice number of 95%. Okay, here's the math notation for it. The probability of your score falling between 1.96 below the mean and 1.96 above the mean is 95%. Another way to think of that is your mark, your midterm mark, has a 95% chance of being plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations away from the mean of the class. Okay? Obviously, if it's above that, you've done really well in class. If it's below that, you've done very poorly in class. So if you are plus 1.99 standard deviations above the mean, you're like extraordinary. You're like 99th percentile. Okay. You've seen this in surveys in the newspaper, read about these polls. This results of the survey are accurate to 95% plus or minus 3%. Have you heard that? You've seen that before? They always say 95%. And the reason they always say 95% is because of that 1.96 standard deviations. Okay. So look for it next time reading the paper about some political poll. Look for the fine print. They'll say the results of this poll are accurate 95% of the time, whatever it might be. The exact phrasing will vary. They'll say 95 or 99. And those numbers are chosen because they're emotionally nice. Everyone likes 95 and 99. But also because they relate specifically to a certain number of standard deviations away from the mean. 1.96 for 95. Okay. Whoa! <laughs> Sweet. I forgot. I stole these slides off of um, uh, a media-rich site, so we're going to have a lot of noise. I forgot about this. I haven't seen these in a couple of years, so we're going to make some mistakes together. It's going to be fun. So we're going to back up a bit and talk about probability, because I mentioned the normal curve is a probability distribution. We're going to talk a little bit about simple probability, probable stuff you covered in public school. Oh, yeah. You know, Tim Hortons, there's always this enormous lineup in front of there, and why don't they just have another kiosk? Why don't they have, I mean, it's a gold mine. Wait, I don't understand that. It's, oh, it tastes really bad. So drink it, though. Oh, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> How am I going to do this? Let's, um, let's see if I can kill the, uh, the sound on the slides. It's going to be a problematic. <laughs> okay. You can still hear me, though, right? Okay, good. A little bit of sound. How's that? It's a little bit. All right. Whew. Oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> that's really annoying. All right. Uh, I'm still Mike, though, right? Okay, good. So a probability is the measurement of how likely something is to happen, obviously. We're going to take this very, very basic, very, very slow. Not all of you have had a background in this. Most of you had. If you have, it's the review. Again, it's review for me too because I haven't seen this in a couple of years. All right. So we we <laughs> name it probability with a number from zero to one. One is perfect probability. It's going to happen, hundred percent. Zero is never going to happen. It's not happening. Zero. So something in between there is where most of the universe lies. In fact, all of the universe lies between those two. If it if it's certainly going to happen, it's a probability of one. If it's not going to happen, it's a probability of zero. 
We tend not to use percentages, even though I will in some examples. We tend to like 0 to 1 because the math works out better that way, but it's fine to say percentages also, 100% versus 0%. <laughs> this is exciting. Okay, so uncertainty lies somewhere between zero and one. So here we go. This is a oh, it's animated. Very nice. So here's a spinner, and the spinner is divided into four pieces: B, C, D, and A. What's the probability if I spin this thing, it's going to land on A? 0.25, exactly. One out of four. So there are four possibilities. And A is just one of them. Okay, very basic stuff. What's the probability that it's going to land on? Uh, come on, same one. Oh, it's three of them this time. Okay. Oh, jeez. Okay, an even number. For this case here, there's one even number. There are three possibilities. One over three. An odd number. There are two odd numbers. Two over three. Right. So still in basic stuff. Here is, oh, that was interesting. Okay, Lawrence is the captain of his track team. Is there a Lawrence here? Yeah? All right, cool. Can't pick, pick somebody. The team is deciding on a color, and all eight members wrote their choice down. So here are the eight choices that they, one, two, three, four, six, seven. Okay. Um, if Lawrence picks a card at random, what's the probability he will pick blue? It's basic stuff. So blue occurs one, two, three times. Three times out of eight. That's a probability, three out of eight. Simple. So here's the overview. Is there's a certain language we're going to use here. An experiment is the thing that we're investigating. It's a, an investigation into a series of events. So Lawrence picking stuff out of his bag, that's an experiment. A trial is one time, one pick. Maybe Lawrence is picking several times, but one pick is a single trial. The outcome is the outcome of a single trial. If I flip a coin, the outcome is just that one flip. If I flip a coin twice, there are two outcomes. The event is the thing I'm looking for. Right? In other words, a success. The event space or sample space is the total number of things that might happen. So in the case of Lawrence picking out his colors, there are eight things he could have chosen, eight cards he could have chosen. So the event space there, a sample space, was eight. Right. One more time. The event is the occurrence of an activity that you're trying to calculate. So the roll of a dice, etc. The simple event cannot be broken down. So a flip of a coin is a simple event. A compound event is made up of several simple events. So if I'm talking about what's the probability of rolling, um, if flipping a coin and getting two heads, that's a compound event. I'm flipping it twice. There are two simple events there. <sighs> okay. The outcome is a possible result. The sample space is all the possible results. The size of the sample space is the number in the sample space. A success is the thing we want, and a failure is the thing we don't want. Let's go through an example. If I am looking at rolling a two one time on a dice, the outcome is the outcome of when I roll the dice. What's the number I get? The sample space is all the possible outcomes. I can roll a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6. The size of a sample size is the number of those outcomes. So 6. There are 6 things I could get. A success, let's say I'm looking at, what did I say, uh, how many, uh, probably rolling a 2. A success is if I get a 2. A failure is if I don't get a 2. Obvious stuff. We've got to get our terminology straight. And a trial, of course, is if I flip it, do it once. That's a single trial. P denotes the probability. We tend to say capital letters are the outcomes, so the probability of A happening is defined as the number of possible successes divided by the size of a sample space. So the very first example of that spinner with four things, A, B, C, or D, the size of a sample space was there are four possible outcomes, A, B, C, or D. The number of possible successes, A, just one, I mean one A. If there are two A's, there'd be two of them. The second example, I have three possibilities, one, two, and three, for that th three-prong spinner. The number of things in my sample space was one, two, three. If I'm looking for odd numbers, the number of possible odd numbers was one and three, so two. So two over three. 
Okay, still with me because that's basic stuff still. Became the foundations long. The event is the coin flip. Sample space, heads or tails. Size of sample space, two, either heads or tails. If I'm looking for heads only, successes are heads. Only one time it occurs, I flip it once. So the probability of getting heads is one over two. Do you get this? If you don't get this, stop me now. This kind of basic, okay? So it's critical to understand we're looking for successes, not failures, and not, and not one time, but all the possible successes if I flip it once. Okay, if I'm drawing cards from a deck, the sample space is the deck of cards. There are two colors. I can get red or black. There are four suits. What are they? Clubs, spades, diamonds, hearts. Each has 13 ranks. Aces, deuces, all the way up to kings. Right? So the sample space is actually 52. There are 52 distinct cards in a deck of cards. What's the probability of, of, of drawing a 10 of spades? Okay. How many successes are there? Possible successes. In other words, how many ten of spades are there in deck of 52? One. Shut up. Stop calling me. Whoever it is. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm talking to my phone. Not you guys. All right. So there's one possibility. The ten of of I should be black. Sorry. The ten of spades exists once in a deck of 52. The number of successes is one. So the probability of getting a ten of spades is one out of 52, or 0 0.02, or two percent. Still with me. Still very basic. Okay, so how about the probability of drawing a 10 of any suit? How many 10s of any suits are there in a deck of cards? Four, right. 10 of spades, 10 of hearts, 10 of diamonds, 10 of clubs. There are four of them. Okay, here they are. One, two, three, four. So the probability of getting any 10 is going to be 4 over 52. 8%. Still with me, basic stuff. It's a matter of defining your successes and counting the elements in the sample space. Okay. Now, there are some Boolean operators we're going to apply. A Boolean operator are words like and, or, and not. You're used to using these in your search parameters on Google or in PubMed. Give me all instances of pretty girls and Russian. I don't know. <laughs> Gave away my personal life. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Um, so the way we think about Boolean operators affects the mathematics that flow from it. So uh, the chance of rolling either a two or a three on, by the way, dice. Dice is singular or die are singular. I was confused. This. So dice is singular. Two die, one dice. Okay, I'm going to screw that up all the time. So forgive me if I get it wrong all the time here. So one dice. No? Two dots? Oh, I don't know. Let's, let's, let's just let's make it random. I don't know. Okay. So if you're trying to get the, the probability of rolling either a two or a three on a die. So what is the probability of rolling a two on a die? Okay. There are six possible outcomes. How many twos are there? One. So one out of six. What's the probability of rolling a three? One out of six. So one, three, and six outcomes. There they are. So, what's the probability of rolling a 2 or a 3? We add them, because suddenly I've increased my chances of success. I'll take 2s and I'll take 3s. I don't care, just give me what you have, right? 2 or 3s, so we add them. This will be confusing for a lot of people. The or means add. It's not intuitive unless you stop and think about it. If I'll take this or I'll take that, it means I'll add the probability of this and the probability of that. So suddenly, the chances or probability of getting a 2 or a 3 is one-third. Now the and is equally as non-intuitive. So how about the probability that both of two different events will occur is a product. So if I'm rolling two die again, two die, two dice, I don't know. The chance of rolling a 2 on both of them. Now. The chance of rolling a two on one die, or dice, is one out of six, right? Is the chance of rolling a two on two die rarer or less rare? It's rarer, so I want a smaller number. So I'm going to multiply these two fractions to get a smaller number. 
So one sixth for the first die, one sixth for the second die. I get this really rare event of one out of 36. That's the commonsensical intuition here. But guaranteed a, a fair proportion of you is going to confuse it. Make an and an add, because and sounds like an add kind of thing. You see an and, you multiply. You see an or, you add. Right? Then there's the not rule. The probability of something happening is always, uh, the, the total probability is one. So the chances of something not happening is one minus that thing. So the chance of not getting a two on a die, or dice die, is one minus the chances of getting a two on a die. Okay, does that make sense? So always the chances of not getting something is a chance of getting that thing subtracted from one. It'd be very useful, especially for complicated compound questions. It's easier instead of adding up probabilities, you just subtract it from the thing that is obviously not there. Right? This can be confusing. Keep in mind that when you're given a probability question or a scenario, you always have the option of the brute force method. The brute force method is to count up everything in your sample space, and that's your denominator, and count up all the possible successes and divide the two. It will always give you the same answer. But as these questions get more complicated, it gets harder to do that. But because I get confused about this stuff quite commonly, I always resort to the brute force method to, to check what I've just done. Okay. So combining the rules involves a lot of uh, uh, complications, and we're going to go some, do some examples in a second. So you have to keep track of the people involved and you know the events in your space and all things like that. So here's an example. What is the chance of rolling two dice, die, dice, dice, and getting a two and a five? So here's the first die. Here's the second die. Okay. So in the first die, we get... Oh, sorry. First, uh, yeah, and these are two uh, two possibilities. Either you get a two on the first die and it's five on the second die, or a five on the first die and a two on the second die. So these are the two scenarios in which our events are successful. So the probability of this first one happening is one out of 36. Why? Because probability of this happening on one die is one out of six, and for this happening is one out of six, and for both of them to happen, it's an and scenario, so I multiply them, and I got 1 out of 36. Okay, So the probability is 1 out of 36 that my first die is 2 and my second die is 5. The probability that my first die is 5 and my second die is 2 is also 1 out of 36. Right? Because those are... Because that's also a multiply thing. So for both of these things together, because I'll accept either one of these scenarios to satisfy this. My question is, what's the chance of rolling two dice and getting these scenarios? I'll accept either one, so I'm going to add them. It's an or scenario here. So 1 over 36 plus 1 over 36 gives me 2 out of 36, which is 0 0.06. That's a compound problem. Right? So I, I used an and first, then I use an or. I multiply, then I add them. Okay. How about getting seven if I roll two dice? Okay, great for playing craps. The probability of rolling a seven on two dice. How many different ways are there to get a seven on two dice? Yes. One? Yeah. None? I can get a one and a six. Yeah. <laughs> I can get a 1 and a 6, I can get a 6 and a 1, I can get a 4 and a 3, a 3 and a 4, a 5 and a 2, or a 2 and a 5. I missed one. Or 6 and 1 and 3. Yeah. So there should be, yeah, six ways of doing it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You're not a gambler, I can tell. <laughs> okay. And how many total combinations can I are there for two die? There are 36 different combinations. A 1-1, one, one, a 1-2, one, a 1-3, one, a 1-4, one, uh, a 2-1, a 2-3, a 2-4, uh, all the way down to 6-1, a 6-2, a 6-2, a 6-6. So I get six successes that I'm interested in and 36 possible combinations. So my sample space is 36 possible combinations. My successes are six. I can just divide them six out of 36 and get 0.17. So there's a 17% chance that if I roll two die, I'll roll a seven. 
That's the brute force method. Counting up all my successes and divided by all the possibilities. You're never wrong using the brute force method, but there are cleverer ways to do it. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, do a clever way later. <laughs> I thought we had a slide for the clever way. We'll get to that later. So, here's some examples. Which of the following is a sample space when two coins are tossed? So, if I cost two coins, what's the sample space? Sample space is, again, all the possible outcomes for two coins. Third option. Third option. Exactly. Heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. Right? That's basic stuff. Next one. Uh, Kennedy Middle School, three out of five students make the honor roll. What's the probability the student does not make the honor roll? That's a case of one minus. Okay? So you start that by asking the probability of making the honor roll. So three out of five students made the honor roll. One minus three out of five is two out of five. So that should be 40%. Is that right? There it is. Yay. Okay. Next one. A large basket of fruit contains three oranges, two apples, and five bananas. If a piece of fruit is chosen at random, what's the probability of getting an orange or a banana? Okay. Now we're getting down to the compound question. How are you going to break this down? Let's ask ourselves, what's the probability of getting an orange first? Sorry, can you see? So what's the probability of getting an orange? Yes? Three out of ten. That's correct. What's the probability of getting a banana? Do I add them or multiply them? Why is that? There it is. Yay! So it should be eight out of ten, which is four out of five, which is first one. Yay! It worked. Whew. I haven't seen this in two years, so I'm glad it worked. <laughs> Pretty embarrassing, we didn't. Okay, a pair of dice, you can't see down there, but a pair of dice is rolled. What is the probability of getting the sum of two? So the brute force method would be how many different combinations of two dice are there? Again, 36, right? So six, all right? How many cases in, can you get a sum of two? One. Snake eyes. There's no other way. So it's one out of 36. It's the bottom one, if you can't see down there. Okay. Um, here are all the possible ways that you can look at. Like, come exam time, you'll, you'll freak out. I can't think about this straight. Just make a little graph like that and say, here are the possible connections that, um, or combinations that a dice can make, and you add them up. Look, it only happens once. There, too. Yeah. Sounds obvious, but come stressful time, you forget. So, in the United States, 43% of people wear a seatbelt while driving. If two people are chosen at random, what is the probability that both of them wear a seatbelt? Oh, interesting, interesting. All right, so who wants to walk me through this one? First of all, what's the probability that one of the two you chose wore a seatbelt? Exactly. What's the probability that the second of the two I chose wore a seatbelt? Not yet, not yet. These are independent events. So I chose this guy, 43% chance of wearing a seatbelt. The second guy, exactly. Now the chances of both of them wearing it is going to be exactly. It's an and scenario. I like to think of it as it's a rarer scenario, so I know if I multiply these fractions, I'll get a rarer, a rarer result. So if, uh, 0.43 times 0.43 is like 0.18. There it is, 18%. Next one. In a shipment of 100 televisions, six are defective. If a person buys two televisions from that shipment, what is the probability that both are defective? It's the same question. Okay? So, the probability the first one is defective is 6%. Six out of 100. The probability the second one is defective is 6%. They're independent events. The fact that I chose this guy has no bearing on the fact that I chose that guy. But the probability that both of them are defective is going to be Multiply or add? Multiply. It's an, it's an, uh, an and scenario. So uh, 6 out of 10 times 6 out of 10 is uh, 36 out of 10,000, which is what? That one, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, what's the probability of rolling? Uh, now we're getting harder. This is a pretty hard one. Uh, probability of rolling at least one six with two dice or two die. At least one six. 
which means we'll take all cases with, with uh, one six and all cases with two sixes. So we can do the brute force method. Let's go through that. The sample space is all these people here. All the possible outcomes, here the die one and die two, you roll a 1, 1, a 1, 2, a 1, 3, a 1, 4, a 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 6, 6. And there are 36 of these possible outcomes. How many successes are there? In other words, how many cases in which there's at least 1, 6? Well, I've done it for you. So in the red here, there's this one, there's that one, there's that one, there's that one, there's that one, and all the ones down here. So it's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So it'll be 11. Okay? So what's my probability then? What do I d divide or multiply? Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so we're still in basic level here. 11 or 36, so 30.6%. 30, 30 That's the brute force approach. I write down all my combinations. I see all my successes. I divide my successes by all the possible combinations. I divide the successes by the event space. Brute force. We learn it this way. Rolling at least one six on two dice is the same as looking for the probability of not rolling 1 to 5 on both dice. You see that subtle tweak there? This is why the brute force method is less confusing, but less clever. We're going to use the, we're going to use the clever but confusing method now. Same question. So if I roll a 6 on a die, I'm definitely assured that there isn't a 1 to 5 on both die. So if I can figure out what's the probability of rolling 1 to 5 on both dice, subtract that from 1, I will get the probability of rolling at least a 6 on one dice. Do you see that logical little twist? So how does that work? The probability of not rolling a 6 on the first die is 5 out of 6. So 5 out of 6 times, I'm not getting a 6. I'm getting 1 to 5. The probability of not rolling a 6 on the second die is also 5 out of 6. 5 out of 6 times, I'm not getting a 6. What do I do with that? Do I add them or do I subtract them? Well, the probability of rolling a 6 on the first die and of not rolling a 6 on the second die is an, is an and question. So I multiply them. 5 out of 6 times 5 out of 6 is going to be 25 out of 36. So now I have the probability of not getting a 6 on both die. And what do I do with that number? Thank you very much. I subtract it from 1. And I get exactly the number of four. I got 11 over 36, or 3.6 percent. So this is the non-brute force method. Obviously, brute force is, is more um, uh, uh, straightforward. But if I've got like a really large sample space, it's not really feasible. 36 is not unwieldy. But like we're in the hundreds, I can't be adding up stuff. So I have to think strategically and logically like this to get the same answer. Okay, if two dice are thrown, what is the probability that at least one of them shows a number greater than three? Very similar question. The probability that at least one of them shows a number greater than three. So let's break that one down. My sample space again, sample space again is all the possible outcomes. Is this, same as before, 36 of them. One, 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 two, one, three, blah, 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 all of these, okay? What are my successes? The successes are the things I'm trying to find. So at least one of them shows a number greater than three. Which ones are those? These ones here in red. So these guys show a number greater than three. These guys show a number greater than three. These three show a number greater than three. And everything down shows a number greater than three. So there are like 18 of these and nine of these, so 27. 27 cases show a number greater than three. So the probability is 27 greater than 27 over 36. It gives me 75%. That's the brute force method. I counted up all these cases, but uh, I divided by 36. Let's try to find the clever way. Got any ideas, anybody? For the clever way? Are you afraid to say it? All right, we'll, we'll work it through together, see what happens. The clever way would be the probability of showing a number greater than three is the same as both not showing one to three. Okay. So what does that mean? That means the probability of the first die showing a 1 or 2 or a 3 is that. Let's back up a second. So the clever way, again, is saying that if something is showing a number greater than 3, it means it's not showing something that's less than 4. 
So if both of them are not showing less than 4, then that's not what we want. So if we subtract what we're not what we want from 1, we'll get what we want. <laughs> right? So probably the first die showing 1 or 2 or 3 is, well, for a 1, it's 1 over 6. For a 2, it's 1 over 6. For a 3, it's 1 over 6. And I add them because it's ors. I don't really, you know, I'll take either one of them. And that adds up to 3 over 6 or 0.5. And probably the second die showing the same thing is also 0.5. Now, what do I do with these two numbers? Because I want a situation in which both of these are true at the same time. So that's an and scenario. I multiply them, and I get 0.25. So that's a probability of finding the stuff that I don't want. Therefore, the probability of finding the stuff that I do want is 1 minus that, or 75%. I know what you're thinking, brute force all the way. <laughs> Don't mess around. Right? But, you know, try it out. So that's your homework, is to try out some of these methods. And, we, and one of them is going to be particularly challenging. Eight and ten might be pretty challenging here, but, but try them out. Um, any questions on this? Yes? Um, I mean, I think we're going to find the uh, sample case for the Yeah. If I give you a question like, what's the probability of rolling a three on two die? That's a fairly straightforward sample space, so you can figure that out. I will give you enough information for you to figure it out. Okay. All good? Yay!